Greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Larry Diamond, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution uh, and uh, co-chair with Admiral Jim Ellis of the uh, project on Taiwan uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, our larger, larger audience as well as our participants uh, in what is now an ongoing conference on ensuring peace in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, for our uh, larger audience, I want to do what I did earlier this morning and thank our Hoover Institution staff, thank all of our participants, and thank the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in San Francisco for their support of our project. Uh, this will be the first of three keynote presentations we will have at our conference, uh, welcoming a broader audience joining us online. Uh, the second of those will follow immediately uh, after this, uh, and my colleague uh, uh, Admiral Ellis will be uh, moderating a session with um, Taiwan's uh, distinguished Admiral Li Shi Min. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, now, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome our first uh, keynote speaker, uh, the President of the Council on Foreign Relations for these past 19 years, uh, uh, and my friend and someone I admire greatly, uh, Richard Haas. Uh, as most of you know, uh, Dr. Haas has had a distinguished career uh, in foreign policy, um, going backwards through his roles. He served as chair of the multi-party negotiations in Northern Ireland that provided the foundation for the 2014 Stormont House Agreement. For his efforts to promote peace and conflict resolution, he received the 2013 Tipperary International Peace Award. Prior to that, as most of you know, he served for two years from 2001 to 2003 as Director of Policy Planning at the Department of State. Uh, and prior to that, uh, from 1989 to 1993, he was Special Assistant to President George H.W. Bush and Senior Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the staff of the, 19, uh, of the National Security Council. In 1991, he was awarded the President's Presidential Citizens Medal for his contributions to the development and articulation of U.S. policy during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He has previous service uh, uh, in the early 1980s in the Departments of State and Defense and has also been a legislative aide in the U.S. Senate, a Rhodes Scholar, and as I think I've already uh, articulated, um, one of the uh, most influential presidents in the long distinguished history of the Council on Foreign Relations. His views are frequently sought out on U.S. foreign policy in general, uh, and he has become an influential voice in thinking about this conundrum of the U.S., China, and Taiwan and how to uh, ensure peace uh, in the Taiwan Strait. So Richard, we now turn to you for uh, your keynote speech, uh, Don't Fix It More Than It's Broke, the United States, China, and Taiwan. Welcome, Richard. Well, thank you, Larry. And thank you not just for the generous introduction, but for all the uh, hours and labor that went into organizing this, uh, this conference that looks at a critical relationship or really multiple critical relationships for the United States. The first of these critical relationships is obviously Taiwan, uh, but there's also another one that's critical in a different way, which is the relationship between the United States and China. And my plan here today is to address how I see things, suggesting both steps to be taken and steps to avoid and most of my comments will, for obvious reasons, focus on Taiwan and the dynamics surrounding it. But at the end, I will say a few things about the larger relationship between the United States and China. Framing is always critical. There are problems, 
and there are situations. Problems can in principle be solved. Situations cannot be solved. But if you are fortunate, if you are talented, and if you are disciplined, situations can be successfully managed. Taiwan is a situation and should not be viewed as a problem. Attempts to treat it as if it were a problem to be resolved will not just fail, but most likely result in a conflict that would leave one and all, the United States, Taiwan, China, others in the region and the world, much worse off. And just to be clear, the reason is not that there is no imaginable solution, but rather there's no possible solution. To use the language of another region, the Middle East, there is no final status outcome that would be universally acceptable. This may not be what everyone or even anyone in this room wants to hear, but I'd argue that while the status quo is not ideal, it is better than any realistic alternative. The good news is that the diplomatic finesse and the framework put in place four decades ago through the three US-China joint communiques, the Taiwan Relations Act and the Six Assurances, this framework has paid off handsomely. Conflict has been avoided. Taiwan has become one of Asia's tigers and has transformed from a one-party dictatorship into a democracy with multiple peaceful transfers, transfers of power. Taiwan has become a model partner of the United States, a thriving democracy with a, with a thriving, remarkable civil society, free press, freedom of religion. It is our ninth largest trading partner and a critical part of global supply chains. It is as well a dependable partner in difficult times as we've learned through COVID-19. At the same time, this diplomacy has allowed relations between the United States and China to develop despite differences over Taiwan. During the Cold War, normalization with the People's Republic of China enabled the United States to work with then Peking, now Beijing, to put pressure on the Soviet Union and eventually end the four decade struggle that was the Cold War peacefully and on Western terms. The United States and China were then able to develop a deep economic relationship. Now to be sure, US-China relations have deteriorated sharply in recent years, but I would suggest not because of Taiwan. Here at instead point to China's militarization of the South China Sea, its unfair trade practices, its growing repression at home, its failure to honor its commitments in Hong Kong and its economic coercion of countries in the region. While I believe it is prudent for the United States to maintain the general framework for Taiwan that has worked well for four decades, some adjustments are called for. There are reasons not to be sanguine or complacent over prospects that what has worked for decades can continue to be relied upon. Most concerning are statements and actions by the mainland. There is, of course, the speculation over whether Xi Jinping is determined to make Taiwan a legacy issue and possibly even use military force. But whatever the future may bring, we've already seen economic pressure from the mainland, cyber attacks on Taiwan, attempts to sow disinformation and interfere in Taiwan's democracy, military flights in the vicinity of the island, and efforts to squeeze its diplomatic space. Also concerning are statements and actions though by the United States. I don't mean to equate what China has done and what the United States has done, but I, as I said, there are also things the United States has said and done that are of some concern. Here I would say in particular, the focus on symbolism, removing contact guidelines, publicizing meetings, the rumored renaming of Tecro is counterproductive. There's no reason to risk provoking developments that would jeopardize vital interests on behalf of considerations that are far from vital. There remains as well the possibility that Taiwan might do something disruptive. The concern has long been a unilateral declaration of independence or UDI. All I can say is that I've met with President Tsai and commend her for her calm and steady handed approach to the mainland but one cannot assume responsible action is a permanent feature of Taiwan's political class. The focus of policymakers here and in Taiwan should be to make sure 
we together have the capability to credibly deter coercion aimed at Taiwan and actually defend it if need be. And from the US perspective, that this be done in a manner that both minimizes the chances of, of conflict with China and more positively, does not rule out a relationship with China that includes selective areas of cooperation. All of which brings me to what I want to say today. I titled my remarks, Don't Fix It More Than It's Broke, something of a halfway house between what might be described as, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and toss it out because it is beyond repair. And I apologize if all this does not translate neatly to those who are depending upon translation. U.S. policy has long been not to, not to emphasize outcomes so much as process, how we would get from here to there. The central interest is that if change is to come, it comes mutually with the consent of the mainland and the people of Taiwan and without coercion. That means no use of force, be it economic or military, by the mainland. And as I just said, no UDI by Taiwan. This continues to make sense as at present, no outcome would be acceptable to both China and Taiwan. Now, I'm fully aware that some would argue with what I've just said and would, would argue to change this. There are those, for example, who argue that we, the United States, has no vital interest in Taiwan and that we should accept what they see, what these individuals see as the inevitability of the mainland taking it over. This judgment reflects the view that geography and military buildup provide the mainland overwhelming military advantage and that the United States would be foolish to resist it and it would only result in costly failure if we did. On the other end of the debate are those who believe that Taiwan is a country in all but name and we ought to end the diplomatic theater and treat it as a country. So let me now disagree with both propositions. Allowing China to successfully coerce or absorb Taiwan would likely undermine, if not spell an end to the US alliance system in Asia, an alliance system that I would argue has been uh, in no small part responsible for the remarkable stability and achievements that have defined Asia now for decades. Asian governments under this alternative scenario would either be inclined to defer to China, an Asian version of what we used to call Finlandization, or become more autonomous which will lead to conventional military and even nuclear proliferation. Any of these outcomes would come at the expense of regional stability and US influence. It would ramp up China's ability to project power into the Western Pacific. China would gain even more leverage over global supply chains, notably semiconductors. And we cannot ignore the fact that over 23 million people would see their hard-earned democracy and freedoms crushed. I would add that here that the strategic pessimism about our ability to deter an attack on Taiwan or defend it is misplaced. War games are no better than their assumptions. Too many seem to forget that war games are meant to stress test our plans and help us improve. They're meant to highlight deficiencies. We have, we have many ways to respond both directly and asymmetrically to the use of force against Taiwan with a wide range of tools and a wide range of venues. I would also note that the Chinese military has had no real experience on the battlefield since it's less than overwhelmingly successful experience with Vietnam decades ago. Returning to the other alternative some put forward, encouraging or recognizing Taiwan's independence in the face of, in the face of mainland opposition would almost certainly result in conflict a rupture in US-Chinese relations or both. Such outcomes would be costly in every sense of the word. This means continuing to make clear to Taiwan the limits to what we would tolerate in the way of its statements or actions that provoke a crisis or conflict. US support for Taiwan should not be construed as a blank check. The TRA is not an unconditional commitment. US policy has long been though not to support Taiwan independence and so should remain. As I noted, some will argue this gives China too much sway over what we do. In foreign policy though, tough trade-offs are often required. To avoid the prospect of war and maintain a working relationship with the world's second largest economy, 
and the country in a position to shape outcomes on issues ranging from climate change to world health to nonproliferation. The United States simply cannot do everything some want when it comes to Taiwan. But rather than emphasizing the few things we cannot do, I'd highlight how much we can do within the current framework. So what should we do if these stark choices are unappealing? I would argue for continued management, but with some changes to what we say and to, uh, in order to deal with the more capable and assertive China and to discourage Taiwan from flirting with independence. What would elements of a somewhat changed policy be? First, we need greater relevant US military presence in the region. This is not the same as necessarily stationing. Indeed, I'd push back against those calling to station US troops on Taiwan, something neither necessary nor advisable. But the US needs to increase the quality of its military forces in the region, coordinate more with Japan, Japan better integrate its forces on Japan with Japanese self-defense forces. It should also, it being the United States, should also explore basing options in Australia and shifting military assets to Guam. There also needs to be a selective strengthening of Taiwan's defense capabilities. We should underscore the need for Taiwan to raise its level of defense spending to a level more consistent with the existential threat it faces. Taiwan might look to Israel as a model, which faces also a, an extremely difficult security situation. I'm not advocating that Taiwan should dedicate 6% of its GDP to defense, but spending 2% of GDP on, mili on military matters should be a floor for Taiwan, not a ceiling. Let me just add to anyone who's thinking uh, uh, is going to charge me with being cynical, this is not about the United States making more money. If Taiwan builds everything it needs domestically, that would have my full support. And by the way, it has shown a great ability to make weapons like missiles domestically. Rather than focusing on legacy systems though, Taiwan might be wiser to focus on building or buying a greater quantity of missiles, drones, mines, and fast attack boats. On arms sales, every American president takes seriously the commitment to provide Taiwan with what it needs to defend itself and to not consult with the PRC on these arms sales. There's no reason why this policy should not continue. We need close coordination, as I suggested, with Japan and with others in the region, and even beyond the region, on military, economic, diplomatic, on a, on a military, economic, and diplomatic strategy of deterrence, and on a response to a full range of scenarios and contingencies from so-called gray area probes and actions to unplanned or unintentional accidents to something that is large scale and intentional. The Quad and the new, newly announced Australia, UK, US arrangements are useful here. The goal should be to reduce the uncertainty about our intentions and as well as our ability to make good on them. In that context, strategic ambiguity the posture by which China could not be sure we would not come to Taiwan's defense and Taiwan could not be sure that we would has contributed stability for the past four decades, but it is no longer optimal. I would argue we should switch from strategic ambiguity to strategic clarity, not, let me emphasize, not as an alternative to strengthening deterrence and defense, but as a complement. Two points are worth underscoring here. Deterrence by certainty tends to be preference, preferable to deterrence by uncertainty. And secondly, doing this would in no way be inconsistent with US obligations under the three communiques. Indeed, we should, whenever relevant, whenever appropriate, reiterate the principles found in the three communiques and the one China policy. We should rein in symbolic moves carried out by this administration and Congress, I should say also by the previous administration. We should, though, continue to encourage Taiwan's membership in international organizations where statehood is not a requirement of joining, and its meaningful participation in organizations where statehood is a requirement. Here, I'd add that when China blocks Taiwan from attending meetings of UN functional bodies like the World Health Organization as an observer, the United States should respond by sending the relevant cabinet level official to Taiwan or hosting uh, 
its Taiwan counterpart. We should do this not for symbolic reasons, but to promote real cooperation and to make clear that Taiwan needs to be part of these important global conversations. We should also launch negotiations on a US-Taiwan free trade agreement. And the United States should do what it can to support Taiwan's bid to join the CPTPP. We should look for ways to expand supply chain cooperation, secure supply chains, especially in semiconductors, and work together so that any semiconductor built in Taiwan is not used to fuel, to fuel PLA modernization. We should be encouraging Taiwan to diversify its trade away from the mainland and support uh, its so-called new southbound strategy to boost ties between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. And in all of these cases, and when it comes to our Taiwan policy, more should be done to explain US interests, policies, and commitments to both Congress and to the American people. This cannot remain simply an elite or professional, narrowly professional preoccupation. In short, we need to make retail but not wholesale changes in our stance toward Taiwan. And the changes have more to do with what we do on behalf of our policy than with altering the policy itself. If we do this, I believe we stand a, a good chance of maintaining cross-strait stability on terms that so serve overall US interests. Let me close with some, real, uh, rem with some remarks on uh, the larger relationship between the United States and, and China. Right now, I would argue there is more U.S. attitude than policy when it comes to China. The objectives are unclear. The definition of success is also unclear. The main goal should be to shape Chinese foreign policy, military actions, and economic practices. We should make it, sh we should make it clear that what we seek is policy not regime change. We should also make clear we do not oppose China's rise. What we care about is how it uses its growing strength. A productive US-China relationship, I would argue, is in the interest of all parties, the United States, China, and Taiwan. In order to succeed here, we need to become more competitive. The Biden administration is taking and advocating for some steps, say in infrastructure, well, one big missing piece is comprehensive immigration reform. Another missing element is a massive investment in public and the quality of K through 12 public education. Externally, the missing piece in our policy is in the realm of trade. The US failure to join what was TPP, now CPTPP is an economic and strategic error. It will be difficult to stop Chinese subsidies, in addition, given our own Buy American programs and government purchases. We need to stop paralyzing the WTO and instead work to reform it. And rather than undertaking unilateral investigations into Chinese, into suspect Chinese trade practices, we should bring cases to the WTO. I would also say we should stop criticizing Belt and Road and provide better alternatives to it. The United States is not in a position to tell countries that badly needed investment should be forfeited or not to accept Chinese lo loans. But in the uh, spirit of you can't beat something with nothing, we should offer better alternatives. The Biden administration seems to recognize this and has announced a plan under the G7, what they call the Build Back Better World. But still unclear months after the fact is what resources this will have, how this will be coordinated with other G7 members, and how the, the effort will be divided up. We might also think hard about focusing on Latin America and Asia, as we can't necessarily compete with BRI everywhere. More broadly, we should make clear that contrary to what has been publicly stated, the era of US-China engagement is not behind us. We should seek cooperation, for example, on regional questions, be it North Korea or Afghanistan or Iran, or global ones such as health and climate. That said, we should stop portraying climate change as a major test of Chinese cooperation from our perspective. We should also reject Chinese attempts at linkage here. What, more, what matters more in the realm of climate than anything China does with us, say in contributing to an adaptation fund, is what it does to reduce its own uh, emissions, including phasing out coal plants at home. We should name and shame China if it continues, or better yet, as I already mentioned, we should join CPTPP 
and support carbon taxes or tariffs as goods made with fossil fuels cross borders. Let me make one last point about China and US foreign policy. Competing with China is essential, but this competition cannot provide the organizing principle for American foreign policy in an era increasingly defined by global challenges, including climate change, pandemic disease, terrorism, proliferation, and online disruption, all of which carry with them enormous costs. In a world increasingly defined by global challenges, US success versus China is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the overall success of US foreign policy. With that, let me end where I began by thanking Larry Diamond and the other organizers for putting together a conference of such depth and breadth. I look forward to taking uh, your, your questions and even your criticisms. Uh, Richard, thank you so much uh, to a degree that you might have partially anticipated but probably couldn't fully. You have deftly uh, engaged uh, a number, uh, a, a really uh, impressive number of the themes that we have already uh, floated uh, in our initial discussions. Um, I'd like to uh, ask our audience now uh, if there are any questions that uh, anyone would like to uh, raise of Richard. We've got about uh, 15 minutes in this session. Uh, and we have a floating mic. Anyone? I, I'd like to ask you first, Richard, um, uh, if we lift strategic ambi ambiguity uh, in the way uh, you have uh, recommended, what specifically do you think um, we should make clear about uh, how we would respond? Uh, obviously, we're not going to uh, commit to uh, operational military details, uh, but are you suggesting that we make clear there will be a U.S. military response, a U.S. military response in the theater, uh, uh, make clear the, the global economic decoupling that would result? Could you put a little more flesh on those bones? I'm not sure I would. Uh, I, hear, I hear a real echo there. You're okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think the United States ought to do its planning. We ought to be consulting with Taiwan, with uh, Japan, Australia, other countries in the region, members of the Quad, uh, and so forth, also with Europe. And I, and I would argue we ought to look at the full array of instruments, military, diplomatic, economic, what have you. Uh, but I don't believe in advance we can or should specify if you do X, we will do Y. A lot will be scenario driven. Uh, we ought to be preparing, by the way, for a full range of scenarios. Uh, it's quite possible we will face you know, what I think I alluded to is gray, gray area probes all the way to, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, an all out uh, assault. What I think China ought to see is these or contingency planning uh, efforts uh, taking place. Uh, they ought to see uh, significant capability in the region. They ought to see various exercises. But I don't, I, I don't think we have to say again, uh, if you were to do this, uh, we, would do, we would do this and not do that. I think part of uh, effective deterrence is also keeping the Chinese, keeping Chinese planners a little bit off uh, or balance. The one thing, though, they should be certain is that if they provoke a crisis, that we will be there uh, to respond. Let me just also say that uh, Taiwan should understand that this, is, this does not necessarily extend to a crisis that it would provoke. That if Taiwan, say, were to go to the extreme end of its options and do something like UDI, under those circumstances, it, it, should, it should not necessarily expect uh, that the United States uh, would do uh, things that we were to do that we would do if, for example, China were to provoke a, a, a crisis. I just think that uh, we ought to be credible uh, in what we can do 
or to be credible. And China will be able, I believe, to, to pick some of that uh, up from our presence and from our, uh, from our, our planning. And I don't think we should be going around saying what it was would be off limits or what we would would uh, not do. We this could be quite asymmetric in terms of uh, instruments used, geographies involved. Indeed, I would think it should be since China would enjoy certain geographic advantages, just given the globe. Uh, we ought to think about how those would be offset again in terms of instrumentality and in, in terms of venue. Great. Uh, and that is uh, also part of what we're starting to talk about. I want to call on Richard Bush, the former chairman of the American uh, uh, Institute on Taiwan. Hello, my fellow Richard. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm in concurrence with about 99% of it. But um, I'd like to ask you to step back a little bit as the president of the premier non-governmental organization concerning America's role in the world and offer your thoughts about um, whether we need to build stronger support for um, American foreign policy among the American public uh, and how we should go about it. Well, first of all, Getting 99% from Richard Bush on this topic far exceeds any uh, ambitions or hopes or expectations I might have had. And I never did that well when I was a full-time student from Richard. I wasn't one of his students, but I never did that well from any of my professors. So this has already been a really valuable and welcome exercise for me, Larry. Uh, look, I worry about that. How do I put this? The Taiwan debate is red hot in the strategic community, the world that you all live in at uh, Hoover and Stanford, the world that I occupy at the CFR, the council, the world that other, the other major foreign policy think tanks and so forth occupy. But if you turn on you know, the daily news shows, if you uh, listen to on radio or podcasts, you read the newspapers, this is a still a, pre a rarely mentioned topic. And implicit in what we are all saying here is that in, in most circumstances, I'll just speak for myself, uh, what I'm saying here, the United States should be prepared to put a lot on the line. That this is a, a, a vital national interest with all that that implies. I worry because this has not been a frequent or subject of public conversation. So I would think that congressional hearings on this topic would be welcome. There's a classroom quality to, uh, uh, to, to, to Congress. I would think that senior people in the administration ought to be giving speeches on this, not simply at the Council on Foreign Relations or the Hoover Institution or Brookings or any other place, but on college campuses they are, or at the Kiwanis Club. Uh, we ought to bring this conversation out of the professional space and into the uh, public space. The next time someone has an op-ed to write about it, maybe not the Wall Street Journal, maybe USA Today. Uh, but I, I just think that this conversation needs to go mainstream. Much more. I don't think it would be healthy if there suddenly were a crisis or even more, even more problematic might be a gray area scenario. The administration wants to do that and Congress and the American people are not there. So I believe that we've got to develop this, this context. It's not anywhere close, I would say, say, don't say a context that exists with, with Europe, with Western Europe, if there was say some Russian foray or probe into, into, uh, into Europe. So I just think that this needs to go, uh, as I said, mainstream. And that, see, that, that to me requires talking about it in non, specialized, valuable as this is, don't get me wrong. This need, maybe it's a, a sequential thing, but increasingly once this box is checked, I really do think that we need to take this into a much more general uh, space. We're, we've introduced at the Council of Foreign Relations into some of our educational materials, which are used in high schools and colleges. Uh, it's that sort of uh, thing. But I would say, you know, for people who are attending this conference, 
the next time you're speaking before general groups, not just specialized groups, but generalized groups and make it a point to speak to general groups. Don't just spend all your time going to councils, committees on foreign relations and world affairs councils, but speak to general public interest groups, speak to churches and synagogues and mosques, bring this conversation into the public space. I think that would be, that would be the, uh, the, the, the path to take here. Good, uh, Orville Schell. Uh, greetings, Richard. Uh, it seems to me we have a rare moment in Washington where uh, we do have some bipartisan accord on this issue. And I'm wondering, as you contemplate the question of Taiwan and the triangle with the US and China, uh, what can you imagine ought to be done to capitalize on that, uh, both by the administration, the Congress, and, 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 and uh, civil society? I agree. I think there is considerable bipartisan consensus on uh, U.S. relations with China. Uh, the, the continuity between the two administrations uh, is, is considerable. If you look at some of the things, say, that Matt Pottinger was writing in our magazine and other people now are saying or writing in this, the different administration, it's, it's very close. And, uh, and all things being, I think it's healthy for American foreign policy when there is considerable continuity, except in those cases where I disagree with the policy, say on Afghanistan, but that's a, that's a digression. Uh, but I do think there, uh, there, 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 there is here. One thing that would be useful I would say is, uh, I'd say two things actually, Orville. One is on strategic clarity. I would actually like to see that uh, more formalized. I would, I would be comfortable if the administration spoke about it, if Congress put it in a resolution. Now, again, it should be embedded in the larger, not as an isolated thing, but embedded in the larger context of the three communiques, the one China policy and so forth. So it makes clear we're not changing the ends of American policy. We're not breaking our commitments. What we're simply doing is modifying how we are, how we plan to proceed on behalf of those commitments uh, to Taiwan and the obligations to the mainland and the three communiques. So I would be comfortable with that. I would also like to see greater discipline uh, in not going ahead with some of the symbolic things. I hope this renaming of Taiwan's office in the United States, for example, doesn't go ahead. There's so much that needs to be focused on that's serious here about capability to deter and if need be to respond. There's so much in the economic realm that needs to be uh, dealt with. Uh, I would love to say, but I'm, I'm not naive, some movement on trade where the United States would think about what would be, uh, what would be enough to get it inside CPTPP. The argument that I've been suggesting in lots of places that we introduce a climate dimension and maybe we can uh, broaden the uh, broad and support within the United States for involvement in free trade if we highlight that trade potentially offers a uh, critical tool for promoting climate change, climate ends. Uh, much more important than anything done at Paris is what could be done, I would argue, within something like uh, CPTPP. So that's the kind of thing Congress, uh, and ideally right now, you've got bipartisan opposition to free trade. I would love to see bipartisan support for American participation in uh, free trade agreements. So I would, you know, so answering your thing, I'd like to see uh, support for strategic clarity embedded in uh, our commitments under the three communiques. I would like to see greater restraint in the symbolic actions with Taiwan. And I would like to see greater involvement in our trade arrangements uh, that I think would help us economically, strategically, and also in the realm of climate change. Uh, is that Zach Cooper? I didn't get a chance to say. Welcome back to your alma mater. Great, well thank you so much, Larry. It's great to be here. Um, I just have a, a question on strategic clarity. So I, I agree very much that we should have a more robust deterrent uh, with China, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. But I'm concerned about what this would mean in particular for Kimoy and Matsu, the outlying islands. So if I was in Beijing, the US gives a uh, clear strategic commitment my first move would be to test that commitment at Kimoi Matsu, where the US actually probably doesn't have the ability to defend. And if we don't circumscribe them from the defense perimeter, 
then we then end up potentially with a broken commitment. And if we do circumscribe them, then we just encourage Beijing to actually go ahead and take them. So my question for you is, how, how would you think about this when you, um, in a strategic clarity argument, how do you deal with the outlying islands? Thanks. <laughs> uh, this reminds me a little bit of uh, the Washington Press Club in 1950 and Dean Acheson, if I remember correctly, speaking about US commitments to the Korean Peninsula. And every time you start placing specific uh, ceilings and limits to those commitments, you tend to invite probes against those areas you've left out. Uh, so I, I, I'm wary of that. Look, I don't think, going back to Larry's first question, I would, I would not rule, say the certain things fall outside and we don't necessarily talk in advance about how we would respond. So we have a full menu of possibilities and we, we should think hard about how we would respond to certain types of Chinese uh, acts of coercion be it threats or actual uses of military force against any number of targets for any number of purposes. And there's a, so I don't, I don't think we have to specify in advance that if they were to do this, we would necessarily respond in this way with military force against that. I'm not ruling it out, but I think we ought to, we ought to retain uh, flexibility. And there's lots of ways to respond in order to uh, inflict costs on China if it were to take actions that we think are uh, inconsistent with regional order. Uh, Karis Templeman uh, will have the last question and then we will uh, uh, leave you to your other multiple responsibilities, Richard. All right. Well, this is Karis speaking, but I'm actually channeling Shelley Rigger here, uh, okay. who, who has a, a follow-up question about strategic clarity. Uh, she's with us virtually for this event. Um, if it became clear that the People's Republic of China would view a declaration of strategic clarity to be a change of policy equivalent to or even worse than, say, changing the name of Tikro, uh, would you reconsider it? So in other words, is there a sense in which strategic clarity itself and saying publicly that we're going to, to uh, advance a policy of strategic clarity, that that itself is a, a symbolic act rather than a, a practical or pragmatic act? It's an interesting question. And let me make clear that more important than what we articulate is what we do. So I'm far, at the end of the day, I'm more interested in bolstering our deterrent or if need be defense capabilities uh, than I am anything, than I think, and than I am anything uh, else. That said, I think as long as we were to embed anything on strategic clarity in the commitment to the two in the communiques. I, I, my own guess is we would be, uh, we would be all right. We've come awfully close to it. If you were to parse all the public statements about rock solid support and the like, there's not a whole lot of distance to, to, uh, to, to, to travel. And I think it is important again um, to underscore what it is uh, we are committed uh, to opposing. Again, we're not, we don't tip our hand to what he would do. So I lean in the direction of, of doing, but I think you raise a, a fair question, but if you're asking me, I would, I would go ahead with it, with the proper packaging it, of it to make clear what has changed, what is not. Let me just make one other point. You, know, you asked this about me uh, or about what I am advocating. Ask the same thing of China. Look at all the things China has said and done since the communiques. Look at all the actions they have taken. Look at all the statements they have made as recently, what, as the last 48 hours. So the idea that somehow we, we are fenced in, but China has tremendous range to say and do things, it, it doesn't seem to me that that is particularly uh, balanced. So my own view, as I think out loud here, is I am comfortable with, with going ahead, and I think it should be explained privately and diplomatically. Uh, before necessarily it's, it, it, it's done publicly, both what it is, but also what it isn't. And I think what it isn't is, is also important. But to me, this is far less of a challenge. Indeed, it's not a challenge to the diplomatic status quo. And, it's, and if, we, if we were to combine it as we should, 
with reiteration of principles that China should, should welcome. Uh, I can't tell you that China wouldn't use it as an opportunity to do some things, but if that's their policy, they'll find something else to use. If they're simply looking for opportunities to change or to disrupt the status quo, they will find it somewhere, they'll find it somewhere else. So uh, again, my own view is that we should be prepared to go ahead with this. Wonderful. Uh, I think we've seen in the last 45 minutes um, why Richard Haas uh, is rightly considered to be one of the most uh, uh, important foreign policy uh, thinkers of um, um, the last generation or so, the current generation, and why he's been such a consequential president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And Richard, the fact that you're uh, turning a considerable portion of your intellectual energy uh, and time now to this issue underscores how important it is. So Richard Haas, thank you again for your keynote remarks and for your engagement with us. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we wish you all the best. Thank you for uh, all you're doing, both in this conference and more broadly, all your work on democracy. It's, uh, you are, uh, what you're doing, what you're writing could not be more important. All right, so uh, thank you, Richard, and I'd like to invite Admiral uh, Li Ximin to uh, come up to the stage, and I will trade places with you, and we look forward to the second half of this uh, broadcast session. Admiral, please. Well, thank you. I'm uh, Admiral Jim Ellis. I'm an Annenberg Distinguished Fellow here at the Hoover Institution, and it's my great pleasure and honor today to introduce our, our next keynote speaker, uh, retired Admiral Li Si Min. Uh, Admiral Li served over 40 years in the Republic of China Navy and was the 26th Chief of General Staff of the Republic of China. He was the highest ranking military officer and the primary military advisor to both the President and the Minister of National Defense. Before his tenure as Chief of the General Staff, Admiral Lee serves as the Chief of Navy and Vice Minister of National Defense. He's currently a senior fellow at the Project 2049 Institute. Most importantly, for today's session, Admiral Lee is credited as the primary designer of Taiwan's overall defense concept, or ODC. In his words, the ODC is a holistically integrated strategy for guiding Taiwan's military force deployment and joint operations, emphasizing Taiwan's existing natural advantages, civilian infrastructure, and asymmetrical warfare capabilities. It is intended to deter, and if necessary, defeat an invasion by China's People's Liberation Army. Admiral Lee graduated from the Republic of China Naval Academy and completed postgraduate officer education programs in Taiwan's Naval Command and Staff College and the U.S. Naval War College. Over dinner last evening, Admiral Lee and I discovered that we were both sailing the waters off Taiwan in 1996 in response to the third Taiwan Straits crisis. A career submarine officer, he was then captain of a Republic of China submarine as I was recently Given the uncertainty in identifying underwater contact, Person and to welcome him to the Hoover Institution to deliver his remarks entitled, Taiwan's Overall Defense Concept, Theory and Practice. Admiral Lee. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alice, yeah. for your kind introduction. And I, I just learned yesterday and not long ago, as you know, that uh, actually I met Elmo Ellis uh, about 25 years ago in the uh, 1996, in, uh, during the time of uh, Taiwan Missile Crisis, when he was uh, commanding the uh, carrier battle groups uh, in the West Pacific Ocean near Taiwan. 
uh, but I didn't have the chance to say hello to him because I was uh, a commanding officer of the Taiwan submarine. I was submerged. So where it's very small, that's the, uh, finally, uh, uh, when we are getting older and we still have a opportunity to, uh, at the same, same, same stage, that's to, to work in something still for Taiwan defense. Wow, that's how uh, lucky I am. Thank you very much. And the first of all, I'd like to uh, express, express my uh, appreciation to Hoover Institution for inviting me to speak here, especially uh, for so many uh, experts about the Taiwan security issues and uh, defense issue in the, in the United States. It is my uh, great pleasure to take this opportunity to introduce the Bao Jiu about the Taiwan's overall defense concept. That is for myself and uh, hopefully uh, also uh, for my government. China's military power is expanding rapidly and uh, has surprised the world. As part of Xi Jinping's great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation and the China dreams, Taiwan is the most important piece of the puzzle. Xi Jinping's ambitions to seek unification with Taiwan is no secret. But if he could not do it peacefully, then the puzzle piece will be taken by force, which is also the ultimate mission of the PLA. Taiwan faces existential threats. So given the extreme imbalance the defense resource across the Taiwan Straits, Taiwan will fail if we continue to use the traditional way to fight against the threat from China. For Taiwan, it is no longer the question of whether we need to change or not. If we want to survive, if we want to defend Taiwan successfully, we must change. This is a matter of life or death. But before we decide how to change, how to change, we first need to make sure that the, we are changing in the right direction. We need to look closely. That's a defense challenge we are facing so that we can find out the correct solution to solve the all the problems. From my perspective, there are four challenges that are creating the problem for Taiwan's defense. The first is PLA coercion. In other words, great zone aggression. PLA's aircraft and ships intruding upon Taiwan's ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone, on a daily basis. Taiwan's military has to take action to respond, to maintain our national sovereignty, and also the people's morale. Second is the possibility of a full-scale invasion by the PLA. Right now, politically, Taiwan has three options. Declare independence, unify with China, or maintain status quo across the Taiwan Straits. However, if the gap in the military capabilities continues to grow wider, Taiwan could only have Two choice, unification or war. If Taiwan refuses peaceful unification, it will only be a matter of time that China chooses to annex 
Taiwan by force. This is the existential threat that Taiwan faces. Third is Taiwan's limited defense resources. How we can effectively allocate the resources is the most pressing issue and the harsh reality faced by Taiwan. And the fourth challenge is about how much time we still have. Former Indo Command Commander Admiral Davidson in his congressional testimony in March this year said that PLA could be capable of a full-scale invention against Taiwan within six years. If we take this assessment seriously, it is extremely urgent for Taiwan to reform its defense, build up capabilities, and prepare for a possible war. It is not an easy task to deal with four challenges at the same time, as I mentioned just now. Because the best solutions to one problem sometimes take away the defense resource from the others. So we must develop a balanced approach to meet our unique security environment. So here is the brief analysis. In order to effectively counter grazing aggression, we need high profile advanced traditional platform and weapons. Unfortunately, this expensive system run counter to the solution to the other three problems. First of all, these large advanced shiny platforms are difficult to survive in the early stage of a full-scale invasion. They can be easily destroyed by enemy's missile and air attack or become inoperable due to neutralization of the critical facility, such as runway or critical C4I installation. Therefore, they are not suitable weapons for countering a full-scale invasion. Second, the shiny, sophisticated conventional systems are very expensive. The opportunity cost is too high for us to pay. Third, these traditional capabilities require very long lead time and are therefore not able to address the pressing military threat that Taiwan is facing right now. To effectively address the threats of a full-scale invasion, Taiwan needs highly survivable and resilient asymmetrical capabilities. That is, large number of small, dispersed, mobile, and lethal weapons. These low-cost, small, asymmetrical weapons are very cost-effective. They can able be established in a short time and be instant capabilities, despite the fact that they might not be as effective to counter the great zone operation in peace time. Obviously, Taiwan's limited defense budgets cannot afford everything. We must take a balance and focus on the worst scenario and make the best preparation. That is to say, Taiwan should invest the more, most of its resource on the weapon systems that can effectively counter a full-scale invasion from China instead of against the gray zone aggression. A full-scale invasion is an existential threat. Gray zone operation are not. The ODC was specifically developed based on 
those strategic, strategic concepts. Now let me give you a summary of the ODC. The ODC is a set of the strategies based on asymmetrical concepts. The focus of the ODC is for, for Taiwan to be able to first resist existential threats. Second, effectively allocate or limited resources. Third, build the instant capabilities to address near-term threats. And fourth, maintain the ability to counter great zone coercion to maintain the public's morale. And the next, I would like to, to introduce to you about a very special concept about the definition of the winning the war in the ODC's theory. Because of the huge gap of military power across the Taiwan Straits, we cannot defeat the enemy totally in the battlefield. Therefore, we must be pragmatic and redefine the winning the war for us. And then we make the best preparation based on this definition. The ODC defines the winning the war as fails the enemy's mission to occupy Taiwan. Instead of totally destroying the enemy forces, under this definition, the ODC specifically established, established some operational concepts based on the threats from the PLA and Taiwan's unique environment. First, is to abandon the traditional war of attrition and adopt the concept of asymmetrical warfare. Second, we need to adopt the concept of denial instead of control. Third, we need to focus on mission kills and uh, attack the centers of gravity instead of focus on destroying real actual forces. Fourth, we need to shape the battlefield conditions to our advantage and engage the enemy when they are most vulnerable. Fifth, we need to utilize the Taiwan's unique geographical environments and the civilian resources. Six, we need to do our best to prevent the enemy from landing our soil and establish the foothold. Seventh, the last line of defense is to conduct insurgency operations to make the enemy not able to effectively control our homeland. Due to time restriction, I will not go into detail of, of this the concept. If you are still in the interest in the, I can discuss more uh, in, in the afternoon. It's welcome. After the ODC series, now I will talk about the ODC in practice. The structure of the ODC includes two major elements: force build-up and the concept of operations. They are supported by an all-out homeland defense mechanism to perform defense in depth. First, I will talk about capabilities build up. We need to think strategically in guiding the force build up. Otherwise, we could easily see the trees and miss the forest and fail to build necessary war fighting capability and with the limited resource. This is the core purpose of the ODC. Any weapon acquisition that is not supported by ODC is not become the capabilities that we can rely on to deter and win a war. There are three category capability build up under the ODC. First, 
high survivabilities capabilities. In my perspective, building highly survivable capability is a form of active defense. The PLA's long-range weapons can be pre precise and lethal. Therefore, when the PLA launch massive missile, missile and air attacks during the initial phase of the war, whether Taiwan force and the capabilities can survive and still perform in follow-on operation will be very, very critical to Taiwan's defense. For the purpose of force preservation, we should not prioritize any weapon that is either on fixed size, enormously large, or lacking in tactical mobilities, no matter how advanced it is. If we want to successfully defend ourselves, the top priority for us is to build resilience operational capabilities that can survive the enemy's massive air and the massive missile strikes so they can carry out follow-on defensive and counter-attack missions. Survivability is not just about weapons, equipment, or platform. Our capability that includes CVISR, target acquisition, are equal importance. Without ISTAR system, defensive operations will not be effective. Second, asymmetrical capabilities. The essence of asymmetrical capability is to have a, a large number of small things. They have to be highly survivable and lethal on the battlefield. They might not attract much attention in peacetime, but in wartime, they can be game changer that decides life or death. Those weapons can cover under the natural environment and launch tiny strikes at the invading forces' vulnerable points. Taiwan's asymmetrical capabilities should be low cost, numerous, small, mobile, dispersed, precise, and lethal. Even if the enemy knows about their existence, it should be extremely hard to locate, attack, and destroy them. If the enemy forces insist on the course of invention, they will pay a terrible price because of those large, small number of the lethal weapons. In order to, con to counter full-scale invention, Taiwan should spend most of its defense resources on the priority of developing asymmetrical capability. Specifically, Taiwan needs C mine and my C mine layer. Unmanned system that includes UAV, UVV, USV, especially for the UAV swan. What I mean UAV swan is we should have a large number of small things. Again, there's always a large number of small things. We should have a large number of small UAV equipped with sensors and 5G technology. Then that can provide situational awareness to the network so that we will know where the target it is. That is very important. Then I believe that this is the uh, kind of a weak point for Taiwan. We need to establish the, as soon as we can. And uh, the man plus unmanned micro missile assault board enhanced by artificial intelligence. Unfortunately, uh, the program had just been killed a month ago. I was kind of uh, frustrated. Small steel missile corvettes, they are under construction in digital industry. Coast defense missile system, like one of AF FMS case recently, Hapong Coast defense missile system. 
land-based micro, short, and medium range precision munitions. Precision guided multiple launch rocket system. Precision anti-armor missiles. Mobile area air defense system. And man pad. Man portable air defense system and anti-armor rocket system. Mobile ISR systems and electronic warfare capabilities. Third, conventional capabilities. In everyday people's mind, large and sophisticated transition platforms are symbols of our national power. Their high visibility makes them effective in peacetime to counter the PLA's great zone aggression and safeguard Taiwan's air and maritime space. Traditional capabilities are also good for the morale of all troops and the people. In this regard, they are necessary. However, their high visibility also makes them vulnerable on the battlefield, and therefore not the ideas for the Taiwan's defense. Too much investment on those systems could squeeze the resource needed to build asymmetrical capabilities, which are far more important for the nation's survival. Taiwan's traditional capability should therefore be a low quantity with high quality system. Their number should only be just enough to meet the requirements so as to lower opportunity cost to us. There need to, there need to be a kind of a mandate minimum percentage level of budget resource allocation for asymmetrical capabilities, such as like 60%. Now I would like to talk about another element of the ODC, the concept of operations which specifically guide the force employment concept operation provides how Taiwan's military will use asymmetrical force under the worst scenario to defeat enemy's mission to occupy Taiwan. The ODC concept of operations can be divided into three parts. First, force protection. The purpose of force protection is to make sure most of the military capabilities are intact after sustained PLA's initial air and missile attacks, so they can employ it to perform follow-on operations. Without proper force protection measure, most of Taiwan's military power could be destroyed or neutralized in the initial phase of war. Having force protection measure is different from constructing highly survivable capability. Force protection focuses on tactics, technicals, and procedures. Taiwan's military performs tactical mobility, dispersed deployment, deception, camouflage, concealment, installing fake targets, electronic jamming, closing defense, redundancy, rapid repair, and more. To make it hard for the enemy to detect, attack, and sabotage our forces. Second, the little room. The second part of, of the ODC is to fight a decisive battle in the little room. This is the phase of operation when Taiwan's military could impose heavy casualty on PLA forces. As the little room, when the PLA force are close to shoreline, Taiwan's military has the greatest chance to integrate the fight. Strikes from the air, the sea, the coast, and the serious damage incoming force with a focus of 
center of gravity that targets such as specialized amphibious lift ships and other high value mission critical assets. The third part of the ODC is beachhead, beach, beachhead battle. We choose the beach as the described the battle beer this destroyed enemy because first, Taiwan is highly urbanized. There are only a few suitable locations for landing and airborne operations. Taiwan can therefore concentrate fire to attack the main force of the enemy. Second, trifibious landing are very difficult and complicated form of operations. When enemy is taking the beach and disembarking, that is time they are most vulnerable and also the timing for Taiwan's counterattacks. Third, this is where all the asymmetrical capabilities can be used to attack the enemies. My final point is on the reserve force and all-out mechanism. Given Taiwan's condition and all-out defense is a representation of Taiwan's resolve of self-defense. Without will to fight, nothing is reliable, not even the most sophisticated weapon system. Currently, Taiwan's military plans to organize and equip the reserve force like the regular army to become an armor type of unit. From my view, it will certainly face the reality in lacking resource for training, equipment, maintenance, facilities, and other logistic requirements. The ODC, however, has a different idea. Taiwan should transform the current reserve system into a homeland defense force to comprise volunteers, conscripts, policemen, firefighters, and coast guard. We can test a spatial operational force to be in charge of their training and the technical support. Currently, the spatial operation force who have a variety of spatial skills is an elite force that still does not have a clear definite mission in Taiwan's defensive mission. They are best force to do the organizing and the training the urban or rural operations and the guerrilla warfare. Given Taiwan's defense budget level and the battlefield requirements, we should equip Homeland Defense Force with lightweight and mobile weapons and equipment such as light arm, IED, improvised explosive devices, man pad, man portable air defense system, man, port man portable anti-armor rockets, precision guided micro or mini missile, micro or mini UAVs main portable communication devices, and light tactical wheel, vehicle, and motorcycle. During peacetime, this system can be stuck locally with the military, police, fire station, and the coast guard stations, so that they can quickly obtain and use in wartime. The Homeland Defense Units will be small and mobile guerrilla war force. They can quickly link up with the local supply depots and arsenal and operate independently and immediately after mobilization. We can train the Homeland Defense Force with an on-site exercise once or twice a year so that their training plan is easier to implement and the cost is relatively low. 
Their mission should be keep simple. They do not have to, to be trained like a regular force. To a certain extent, they don't even have to wear uniforms. Their responsibility is to fit in with the local people for hit and run type of guerrilla warfare, to deny the enemy forces. They should not be used to fight with the enemy in an urban defense operations that aims to seize control. There are many in Taiwan who do not agree with this idea. They think the militia's kind of a force is no match for the PLA. But I have to say that in my perspective of having the will to fight and complicating the enemy's operational plan, force is organization, not the combat skill. I said again, for the deterring and the complica complicated invention of operation of an enemy, defense organization is important than real combat skills. A resilient all-out homeland defense mechanism in Taiwan will greatly complicate the PLA invention plans and therefore therefore strengthen the deterrence. Also, many people in Taiwan think that if the country is at war, young people will not stand up to fight for their homeland. In my opinion, I think it is not completely objective and not fair enough to impose such a negative assumption on young people without the concrete evidence. Especially when the government doesn't have a feasible plan for them to join the line of defense for the country. I do believe that all young people will be willing to defend their own country. As long as government provides a pragmatic and viable all-out defense mechanism. I deeply believe that as long as Taiwan can implement the idea from the ODC by establishing a proper weapon acquisition policy, restructuring the force, developing the doctrine, operational plan, and the suitable training system, Taiwan can build up its own deterrence capabilities by itself. It doesn't matter whether the U.S. government is to take strategic clarity or ambiguity about Taiwan. As long as U.S. can help Taiwan to establish credible self-defense capabilities, it would be the best strategy for the U.S. to ward Taiwan defense. And finally, I would like to say that there is hope over the horizon for Taiwan to establish asymmetrical capability. Just a few weeks ago, Taiwan's executive yuan approved a five-year, 8.5 billion US dollar special budget. And uh, there are many programs in line with the uh, definition of asymmetrical layout in ODC. And I believe this is a good sign for Taiwan to put asymmetrical capability in a higher priority. I do believe that this is a positive result of cooperation between the Taiwan and the United States. Let's continue to proceed forward. And that concludes my presentation to you on the theory and the practice of Taiwan's over defense concept. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're very close to uh, to the break time to uh, for our lunch, and uh, it's time probably for uh, uh, for only one 
question. First off, I want to commend you, Admiral, for your, your vision and your insights and the, and the work that you have done, not just this year, but over many years to, to craft a, a concept that doesn't just talk about things and procurement, but talks about concepts of operations and then deals very candidly with the, the societal implications of what it takes to, uh, to create a, uh, a, a capable force. So uh, sincere congratulations of, on that and on the passion that you have, uh, you have brought to this. Uh, it clearly has had great effect in, uh, in your speeches and your travels, and, uh, and certainly that's uh, once again the case here today. You ended on, a, on an optimistic note. Uh, the budget levels are up. We saw some of that in our presentations this morning. There's beginning to, uh, to get some traction on the, uh, the asymmetric uh, large number of small things. You, we know that there's a proposal coming to, uh, to talk about potential reforms for reserve uh, organizations and the like. Uh, overall, uh, you, what are the milestones that you think we need to track over the next years to see that this continues to progress as you think is necessary uh, for uh, success of the ODC over the years to come. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think it's, it's a, I think it's most important, uh, it's very essential uh, issue. Thank you very much for this question. You know. In Taiwan, we have already uh, over invested for kind of shiny platform of traditional weapon system. But from the sign of this, this time, so five years, the, uh, the uh, special budgets, I find out still there is increase that trend for the uh, asymmetrical capability. But in the future year, I think that's most important is we have to get consensus in Taiwan without consensus on asymmetrical capabilities, how we can really increase this kind of capabilities. For instance, the, I found out that there's a big percentage on this uh, special budgets the, uh, concentrating on, uh, on a very long range land-to-land -land cruise missile or ballistic missiles. I noticed that the, uh, there are lots, lots of the people believe this kind of weapon is a kind of asymmetrical capabilities. But according to the ODC's definition, missile is not only element for the asymmetry. First, we have to take care of the, or how much money we have because this long-range missile could not carry with nuclear munition. And the number of that kind of long-range missile is still much less than the PLA, PLA have. If you try to use this kind of a tactical to against the uh, China so-called source attack, we just uh, shoot the uh, long range the missile to the China mainland. I don't think we will get a good result on that because they have much more. If you hit the mainland, their morale, their nationalism will be strengthened. It's not good for Taiwan. In the meantime, the longer you fly, the, the more money you have to pay. Then there's another opportunist cost. So we have to think it's, think it's over. I always say it's a large number of small things. That is because I consider the most important fact is money we have. Of course, I like to have a kind of 3,000 kilometers missiles. I, I want to be, have, uh, ha have a battle, have a decisive battle overseas. Everybody wants, but probably we are small, they are long. So in the future, how to get consensus? I think it's most important, and uh, maybe uh, any one of you, you can devote something 
for this part. My conclusion is that currently, there is a lot of explanation, interpretation for the asymmetrical capabilities. ODC is only one of the explanation, one of the plan for asymmetrical capabilities. Although there's no other concrete theory or in practice to describe what is asymmetrical capabilities. There is no problem for Taiwan from the official to the civilians. Everybody said asymmetrical capability is most important to us. So we need more airplane, we need more tanks, and we need more long range missiles. That is problem Taiwan have. So in my article in the uh, last year with uh, Eric Lee, I said, for the Taiwan defense, we better, for the cooperation between the United States and Taiwan, we better establish kind of joint working group that's comprised of policy level and the working level. Working level don't discuss about what is the asymmetrical capability, what is asymmetrical weapons. Policy level decides, and if the, we can get consensus between the United States and the Taiwan for the uh, real meaning, the definition of asymmetrical capability, then United States is obligated to assist 100% to assist the Taiwan to develop real asymmetrical capabilities. So I hope the, uh, you are your, your ladies and gentlemen, you are all experts. I hope you can promote for this. We can form the joint working group and de decide it. This is Taiwan's need as a capability. This is as a capability, different from the US as a capability, different from China as a capability, different from Japan's as a capability. It is for the Taiwan's survival. It is asymmetrical capability. Then we concentrate our efforts to make it happen. Then we establish our self-defense capability. Then I believe it will meet the mutual interest of the Taiwan and the United States. You don't have to consider too much about the military invention as long as Taiwan can really establish a kind of uh, self-defense capability, and China just cannot occupy the Taiwan. This is the goal for the ODC, and I hope you can promote it in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral, for your insights, for your passion, for your service to your country for 42 years, and now continuing to serve in in articulating and thinking about this, uh, this important concept. So uh, thank you all very much, and uh, please join me in another round of applause for Edmund. <laughs> we are adjourned for lunch, and we will reconvene at 2.15. Lunch will be outside in the, uh, in the courtyard. Thank you. <laughs>